Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Zerker, host of Looking to the East here on Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome to our show this week. We have a very special guest with us. As uh, you may recall, last, uh, last show, uh, we were taking a look at the economic impact of the Ukraine invasion, and I had some experts from Europe and Japan, and we often were talking about uh, Taiwan as a part of this uh, overall uh, economic uh, Im impact of uh, the Ukrainian invasion. And uh, Jiri Mseki, who was on the show with me, uh, and I know Andrew, our guest, very, very well <clears throat> from his days in Japan. And I thought, well, we should find out what's going on in Taiwan from someone who's actually there and in a very important role. So, Andrew, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for attending. I know it's very early in the morning. Uh, for you in Taipei. Andrew is the president of the American Chamber of Commerce uh, in Taiwan, but he's held a significant number of interesting positions uh, previous to his current role. So let's start at the beginning. Andrew, tell me, I looked at your, your LinkedIn page and your background, and uh, you studied uh, international relations in college and uh, seemed to be very interested in this type of career from uh, at least your college days. Uh, can you tell me what got you interested in this role that's led to so many interesting positions for you all over the world and now in Taiwan as well? Very glad to. Very good to see you again, Steve, after Thank a you. great yeah. Aloha to everybody. Uh, glad to be joining uh, uh, the program and share a few, a few views. Uh, thanks for taking me back uh, a number of decades to how I got started in the <laughs> international game. Uh, fortunate uh, confluence of factors, probably similar to many people you talk to who wind up in, a, in an international gypsy mode like I did. Um, first, it helped where I was coming from. I was growing up in Buffalo, New York, late 70s, early 80s. It wasn't... Um, a go-go happy time for that part of the world. Uh, so there was some impetus to explore, you know, uh, uh, broader horizons at the time. Uh, I had the means to get uh, overseas coming out of high school, courtesy of the Rotary uh, Foundation, which had very generous uh, exchange uh, fellowships. And I was lucky enough to apply and win one of those. Uh, then I was fortunate to have a couple really good teachers and mentors who planted the the seed and also directed where I might want to go. Uh, wonderful Asian studies teacher uh, out, of, uh, out of junior high school who had been to every country she taught about. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I had a, a great uncle who had a warm fondness for Asia and Japan in particular. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and these two told me, well, uh, 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 East Asia would be a wonderful place to go. The most exciting options I had were India and Japan. And I had one more influence. I came from a larger family and older brothers and sisters were out exploring Europe. And they said, hey, that's pretty easy for an American with limited languages as, we, as many of us have. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you go further? And so I stretched it as far as I could. It was a toss up between India and Japan. I'm mm -hmm. uh, very happy that I chose Japan. It altered my uh, awareness, development, and family connections because I met and happily married uh, a fellow exchange student who was headed from Japan to Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and that planted the seed. And then, and then I knew I wanted to do international. And that sort of uh, uh, programmed me on that course where uh, college education kept me on the Japan track. International relations really sparked the interest in international commerce and trade. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, when I was considering careers and the foreign service appeared, I targeted in particular the commerce department's foreign service wing mm -hmm. because I wanted to be closer to business, closer to action on the ground. And that ended up being a, a great choice because I had a very uh, dynamic, enjoyable, eclectic uh, overseas career with the Department of Commerce. So you were an exchange student at, at one point, either in high school or in college. Is that correct? Correct. So uh, oh, full okay. year, uh, living in, uh, in Saitama, Japan, a bed town north of, uh, of Tokyo. I had right. four host families and I went, it was lost on me, but I went to a hyper-competitive all-boys school uh, where I was the, um, 
just about the star in English and, and almost nothing else. <laughs> yeah, we do achieve that status when we come to Japan. <laughs> Especially back, back in that day when uh, I and a few Mormon uh, missionaries were the only ones uh, uh, in, in town from, from, from outside Japan. Uh, but I'm still in touch with uh, those classmates of uh, you know, 30 plus years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, some exceptional people. One is in training uh, uh, to head back to the International Space Station, where he uh, has a record as one of the longest serving. Oh, my. Uh, wow. That's, um, and he's hoping to get, make his third uh, um, uh, trip uh, shortly. Mm -hmm. So was it difficult to get into the uh, Commerce Department? I, I often... I've had guests in my classroom or on the show that are in the State Department, and they tell me that that particular set of exams and so forth is quite challenging. Is commerce, I would imagine, is the same? The time that I came in, it was actually a, 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 a single channel. So I took the same foreign service exam. Oh, you did? Okay. And, and went through the process of uh, yeah, fairly rigorous written screening and then a quite rigorous all-day uh, uh, oral uh, exams. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, lucky enough to get through that, I was then confronted with a, a chart where you could check off the agencies of interest. And uh, this was now the height of, um, of U.S.-Japan trade frictions. So anybody in the 80s we're talking about? Yeah, we're talking okay. um, yeah, early 80s, mid 80s. Right. Uh, and, and anybody with some Japan background was in high demand for the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. So it was an interesting situation. The State Department was actually courting me and saying, oh, come on in. Well, you know, uh, the water's warm. Uh, we've got some interesting assignments for you. Wow. And, and the Commerce Department was oddly, just because it's a small operation and, and uh, without the scale, it's hard to, uh, um, to, to take in and place people where they want to head. So they were telling me, I'm, you know, we're not so interested. And if you come, uh, you're not going to go to Japan. Uh, but I persevered because I believe that long term, that was the, the very interesting career path. And it worked out well because they had another interesting assignment for me, which I was interested in, and that was Korea. Uh, oh, so, so I, your first assignment oh, with the Commerce Department was Korea? Four years um, in, 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 in Seoul, uh, pre-chorus days, obviously a very challenging market at the, at the time, early years of, uh, of democratization. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that proved to be fortuitous because it expanded my horizons. It kept me uh, in East Asia. Uh, but then again, as I mentioned, I ended up doing a, um, a, quite a wandering through a range of markets and I left. Uh, yeah, I was looking. Yeah. It was all over the world you were posted. Yeah. So in the Mexico, Middle East as well Peru. as Asia. Uh, Mexico uh, loomed on the, uh, on the horizon next. Mm -hmm. uh, and then had, having gotten Spanish under the belt uh, by studying in country, Peru was a natural uh, next stop. Uh, then uh, 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 Germany, uh, mm -hmm. I made a, uh, uh, a very interesting venture from there to go to serve in, in Baghdad. And I spent about 20 months in the international zone uh, there. Wow. Uh, came out of that experience and said, I'm ready to recharge in Asia. Uh, Hong Kong was available. Um, so I had uh, four very good years uh, in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the chance to, uh, to return to Japan came up and I made it. Yeah, I hear that Japan uh, placements are very, very competitive, that many diplomats uh, in the State Department, the Commerce Department, want to serve here for because of the quality of life and so forth. So usually, you know, even our consulate here, uh, people like Karen Kelly and Richard, who I'm sure you know, I mean, they're very senior and they get these roles. It's usually their last uh, assignment in their long, long careers here. So yeah. I'm not surprised it took a while to get to Japan, but it, uh, we're, now as you were going from these place to places, uh, were you doing essentially the same thing or were you doing different roles in each of these countries? Well, Commerce is a specialized and smaller agency in the international space. And mm -hmm. uh, so we do have, uh, unlike 
uh, the State Department diplomats who might take a range of very different differing. They might be an administrative officer uh, at one post. They may have started out on the visa line with consular work, but then their specialty may be political for much of their career. The Commerce Department's mission is uh, promoting U.S. exports and the interests of U.S. companies overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, the Natural Alliance and how we got to know one another through the American Chamber of Commerce is a core right. Uh, for those officers, so much more similarity in the in the function, um, and, and that made it possible to jump from such uh, different cultural milieus because the the crux of the day to day work was consistent. Mm -hmm. So you just had to had to pick up the local flavor, the the local market dynamics, uh, but you could uh, essentially bring your toolkit to bear in uh, in in every market. Right. Yeah. And I have to say you were you're particularly good at that, you know, networking and promoting the interests of the US when I was working with you when I was involved with the ACCJ here in Japan. Okay. So let's move forward then. You after 20 some odd years of working in the Commerce Department and living in all of these exotic and wonderful locations, you decided to do something new to move uh, outside of uh, government service. And uh, I think uh, you began to teach and do some other things. But eventually, you decided to take a position uh, in Taiwan at, with the American Chamber of Commerce, which, of course, you must have known really well. I know certainly in Japan, you were working very closely with us when you were in the Commerce Department here, but you probably did that in other regions as well. So tell us how you ended up becoming the president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Taiwan and got that exciting job. Sure, thanks. Well, the transition out of the Foreign Service was, was also an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. uh, the last assignment I took leaving Tokyo was a non-traditional one. It was a uh, posting as a, a visiting professor at um, National Defense University in, in Washington, D.C. Right. And this was an exciting time to be looking at um, uh, defense mobilization, uh, economic security issues, uh, things that I had touched through my career and now had an opportunity uh, to go back, share, teach some of what I had learned in the trenches back, uh, uh, back in the classroom and to think about what I wanted to do in the future and where I wanted to, to base myself. And uh, the international uh, fever in me was still pretty uh, strong. So as much as I am... After all these years, Andrew, yeah. <laughs> you, you wanted to hop on a plane again. <laughs> I was ready after, uh, after, after a couple of years, as much as I yeah. enjoyed uh, the, the stimulation of, uh, well, of academia and D.C. in particular. It's a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful place to, to, to base yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was actually an opportunity to work for the U.K. government. Right. So casting about for something to do, and, and the coronavirus was casting its net on all of us. Uh, mm -hmm. one, of, one of the opportunities that was before me was to be a locally employed uh, hire uh, in Japan working on the life sciences sector. So very much akin to the work I did with commerce with a, with a sectoral focus, 50% uh, looking at Japan and 50% um, uh, 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 greater East Asia for the UK uh, trade and investment uh, uh, office. Mm -hmm. And I uh, asked particularly not to go back to where I had been, which was uh, Eastern Japan, Kanto and Tokyo. But I said, I want to explore the other side, the Asia facing part of, of Japan and Kansai brought me into your neighborhood. And the best part of Japan, I might add. It is a wonderful place to live and to, uh, <laughs> experience. so glad I did that. Um, but um, in, in the course of that, it became very difficult to do the regional piece because nobody was moving anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. With Japan's uh, uh, constraints, it was difficult just to get into the office. And uh, uh, at that time, one of the uh, markets that was freest of the pandemic uh, and the most normal activity was what happened to be Taiwan. And they yeah, were- It was a star in the early days of COVID and that the infection rates were, New Zealand and Taiwan were the two that I remember as doing an incredible job in the early stages of the pandemic. It did it in a smart, humane fashion, really leveraged um, technology very effectively, and, uh, and, and were blessed with a very cohesive and supportive public. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a fascinating transition to go from Washington, D.C. to Japan and Western Japan and then to Taiwan and do a cultural comparison of how people uh, react. So just as an aside, uh, one thing that surprised me, I thought I knew something about Japan and East Asia, um, and, but my stereotypical view was that the Japan, Japanese were going to be very regimented, very cautious and careful, lockstep behind whatever public advisory they got on, on, on behavior, mm -hmm. and that the Taiwanese and the Chinese mindset might be a little bit more uh, risk accepting, a little more individualistic, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps not so uh, uh, accepting of, uh, of guidance from the top, just the opposite. When I arrived in Taiwan, uh, having seen how some Japanese were pushing back and looking to evade uh, some of the restrictions, the Taiwanese were saying just the opposite. You don't need to tell us to be careful. We'll be more careful than you're suggesting. Uh, Interesting. And that was a key part of the, uh, of, the, of the success that Taiwan enjoyed, not just for the early stages, but really up until May 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, remarkable success at at keeping cases down to a down to a handful um, of serious cases. Fast forward, uh, a remarkable opportunity opens up at a great chamber that enjoys a remarkable uh, uh, cooperative relationship with the host authorities, with the U.S. government. It is uh, while it's in the same space of AmCham's around the world, it operates very differently. Mm -hmm. I had seen that coming out of Tokyo and making a visit where I went for, to a regional uh, gathering of AmCham's hosted in Taipei, and it coincided with their annual thank, thank you banquet to the host government. Mm -hmm. And President Maing Zhou himself uh, attends the banquet with 500, 600 business leaders and doesn't drop by, he spends the evening with the American business community. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just a one-off, this is, it turns out, is the annual rhythm of things. Uh, that's the access that and the relationship that this chamber and business community enjoy over their 71 years now of, of, of operation. So we were um, uh, able to pull off another 700 head extravaganza just on March 30th uh, mm -hmm. with President Tsai Ing-wen, the AIT director, Sandra Oudkirk, and uh, another 700 um, leaders from the business and political communities uh, were able to mix and mingle and, and do the kind of networking and discussion of how to make Taiwan a more open competitive market uh, that we've been able to do now for decades. And I'm right. in the position of, uh, of being able to be a, a small part of that. So it's been, it's been a great year. Wonderful, yeah, you're coming up on a full year now in, in that role. Um, how big is the chamber? Of course, the, you know, I'm familiar with the American Chamber of Commerce here in Japan, which is, a, very influential and, and you know 3,000 members and so forth and also has the similar access to both government contacts and uh, embassy contacts as well so uh, in terms of members are most of the American companies that are located in Taiwan a part of the American Chamber and do you also have uh, local businesses Taiwanese businesses that have joined as we've observed here in Japan with the ACCJ Yes, Steve, we, we do. Um, just a uh, quick bearing size-wise, we're, we're not in the, uh, of, the, of the Japan scale. Uh, we're pushing 1,100 individual members. In That's about, still a huge number. That's big. It's a good size. It's, it's, yes. it's a large chamber, about 540 companies. Uh, wow. We've grown uh, maybe 10% over, over this past year. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a, a diverse base of uh, uh, the largest share would be American capital, American origin companies. Uh, but but a goodly number of Taiwan uh, companies and third country uh, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we have 26 uh, sectoral committees, which is a bunch. Uh, Whoa, okay. And, and what maybe no wonder you're so busy. <laughs> what may be a surprise is what was not on the um, uh, roster until uh, just about uh, uh, three, four months ago, and that is a semiconductor committee. So uh, I found it sort of akin to being posted to Saudi Arabia and finding there was no oil and gas committee. Uh, That's right. And when I think of Taiwan, I mean, their most successful industry, it's that one. Yep. Uh, and the firms were there. The interest was there. They just were organized uh, in a tech committee and, and didn't have that focus 
Uh, but with the intensity of, of scrutiny from all, all governments, all public sectors, uh, uh, industry itself, trying mm -hmm. to de-kink supply chains, work on you know, really uh, challenging human resource uh, limitations, uh, and, you know, energy uh, issues around the tech sector. Uh, there really was a crying need to come together uh, a, as a group and to draw from uh, all those national groups. And, and we're in the early stages, but having great success. And that's fueling uh, some of the growth of our chamber. People are really interested and enthusiastic uh, to get on board, uh, see what we can do through public-private partnerships to tackle uh, some of these really thorny issues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So over the last year, um, what, what have you learned or observed in terms of the trading patterns in Asia? You know, Taiwan's an economic uh, power uh, and has a strong relationship economically with Japan. Uh, and even though you're with the American Chamber of Commerce because of your background uh, in the Commerce Department and working in, in Japan, I'm sure you, you have visibility or interest in how Taiwan, Japan is doing. And also, of course, your natural interest, and that's uh, encouraging trade between Taiwan and the United States uh, in both directions. So can you give us an overview of what you've learned over the last year? Are these relationships growing currently, despite the pandemic and other political pressures that are out there, obviously, in Asia? Yeah, uh, it's an it's a incredibly um, uh, uh, fluid uh, and dynamic time to be stepping in and, and learning about Taiwan. Uh, mm -hmm. The economic relationships are changing and, and growing. The geopolitical uh, forces, the uh, pressures uh, in that uh, uh, bilateral uh, and triangular relationships between uh, Beijing, Washington, and Taipei are uh, uh, indeed having an impact on trade uh, uh, patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the bigger picture is that it's a bright scenario for Taiwan in recent periods when we look quantitative and qualitatively what's happening with uh, Taiwan trade and investment. The economy grew at, at a remarkable pace uh, last year. It's um, highest rate in, I believe it is, uh, 11 years, over 6% GDP wow. growth. That's remarkable. And, and, uh, and, and two big drivers. One, we discussed um, the relatively permissive business environment. Although borders were closed, movement internally was free. There was not industrial disruption. Uh, and, and so Taiwan was a beneficiary there. Uh, in addition, the areas that Taiwan is strong in, not just semiconductor supplies, but the ICT, telecom, uh, electric vehicle, uh, 5G sectors were all ones that were in hot demand, in part driven by uh, coronavirus pandemic uh, you know, forces. Uh, everybody needed uh, work from home kit and Taiwan was ready to, to uh, supply those exports. So that was a big boost. Uh, perhaps paradoxically, the tensions across the strait uh, uh, redounded again to uh, uh, Taiwan's benefit and fallout from uh, Trump era sanctions and, and US China tensions also had a, a tendency to support uh, China as, as trade patterns readjusted. There was a significant reshoring of uh, Taiwanese investment out of China into Taiwan. Interesting. Or China. Yeah, I, you know, historically, Taiwan was one of the first countries to begin to do uh, outsourced manufacturing in, in mainland China back in the old days. So now it's actually beginning to come the other direction. That's interesting. The, the footprint remains massive. And yeah. although there was in relationship to Taiwan's economy, an appreciable move backwards. The orientation of trade and investment to China remains at, at, at a high level. So I don't want to okay. overplay that, uh, um, that, that, that portion. Uh, but again, uh, uh, I think Taiwan uh, firms are in uh, being appreciated globally for uh, their importance in a lot of critical uh, high technology uh, supply chains. As you know, uh, not just uh, the US, but Japan and Europe uh, are eager uh, to draw Taiwan as a partner, TSMC, uh, the flagship foundry 
uh, semiconductor manufacturer in particular to mm -hmm. help reestablish and shore up supply chains in all of those markets. Mm -hmm. uh, those are not, it's not a single firm moving to Phoenix or to Kumamoto, but an entire ecosystem that needs to come along with those firms. So sure. that's fueling some, some interest. Uh, back in, in North America and the East Coast, uh, Honhai or Foxconn, as it is known, is uh, investing aggressively in the, in the uh, electronic vehicle space that's stimulating growth in battery technology. And uh, Taiwan is at a position now where there's a, there's a happy uh, meeting of interests where just at the time where either energy or just space constraints are pushing Taiwanese companies out, we have a welcoming pull uh, from, from key trade partners, an opportunity for Taiwan to diversify its trade pa patterns uh, mm -hmm. uh, outside of, of, of China, which is a, a, a national priority of, of the Tsai administration, mm -hmm. uh, and also to move up the value chain to get out of uh, contract manufacturing and to, and to become an OEM or system supplier or, mm -hmm. or brand um, uh, overseas, I think is a, is a fascinating process to watch. And I think something that our member firms can support and our chamber itself through some of the uh, orientation or training or counseling or human resources development, we can add uh, to, to ensure that those companies just don't go overseas, but they go overseas and succeed uh, mm -hmm. for, for the long term. So, um, so, hey, Andrew, we're running out of time. This always goes by so quickly, but I <laughs> sure. want to close as a veteran uh, as uh, in wanderlust and <laughs> living all over the world. Can you can you just maybe in a minute or two tell me about what the first year has been for you to live in Taiwan as, as compared to Japan or maybe some of the other locations? Have you adapted well to Taiwan? Are you enjoying yourself there and your family as well? Yeah, uh, a good note to end on because it has been a, a delight on a, on, a, on a personal level uh, that the friendliness and warmth of the Taiwanese who I'd met uh, off and on over the years still took me by, by surprise. Uh, uh, I've gotten a welcome all throughout uh, Asia, always with a different flavor or characteristic. Uh, but anybody who's not been here, I would encourage you to, to, to give it a try. Um, the uh, predominance of English is uh, perhaps surprisingly um, strong here. There's a big push to go uh, uh, bilingual uh, in the education system. Mm -hmm. uh, and Taiwanese are just wonderfully welcoming people. The dislocation of the year made it tough because I had some family separation, but my wife, uh, 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 I mentioned is originally from Japan, has joined just over the, the Chinese New Year. And mm -hmm. so we're making a, a comfortable life in, a, in a, uh, the northern section of Taipei and just really enjoying getting to know the, the culture in this very rich island. Wow. Yet another adventure for you. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for, again, waking up early in Taipei and uh, spending time with me on, on my show. I think this has been very interesting. Um, <clears throat> you are hiring, I noticed, on your LinkedIn page. You're looking for people. So any of the viewers who are interested in working with Andrew or maybe replicating his life, uh, his uh, uh, career as it's moved through uh, the various stages and uh, living all over the world, you can check out Andrew's LinkedIn page and you'll see more information about the open position there. Andrew, if I was younger, uh, I'd be applying, I think. <laughs> You'd be welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, viewing the show. Uh, I'll be back on again in uh, a few weeks with yet another topic on looking to the East. Thank you and goodbye for now. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, 
and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.